Musician, composer and child prodigy Mal Pope was signed to Elton John's record label when he was just 13. The Swansea Schoolboy songs had been promoted by legendary Radio 1 DJ, the late John Peel. But although superstardom has eluded Mal, he's an established radio and TV presenter and writer of hit musicals. When taking a break from work, music is still at the forefront, as he's often singing on the terraces of the Liberty Stadium, supporting his beloved swans. The pitch is a stone's throw from where he grew up. I was born in, in a little terraced house in Brynhavrid in Swansea back in 1960. It was my grandparents' house and eventually when my granddad uh, died in the, in the mid-60s we moved back there. So I've always uh, lived in that sort of area and, and very attached uh, to it. So, you know, uh, an area which I always think looking back on now was, was almost like the surface of Mars, you know. We did have mine shafts around the, the, around the place that we would Play around. They were all sort of, you know, covered up, but it was a, a very post-industrial area, and particularly looking through the Swansea Valley, it was, it was, you know, scarred. The youngest of three boys, Miles was a close-knit family with strong links to a local chapel. It's been 25 years since Mal was last there, and it's now used as a builder's storage room. A return visit stirred up some strong emotions. Yeah, this is a lot more emotional than I. Than I thought it was going to be, really. I, it's been a long time since I was in this room and I spent most of my childhood here, to be honest. Um, I can still see all the people. My Uncle Dan, he wasn't a real uncle, he was my Welsh uncle at the front here. He used to pitch the hymns. Uncle Fred, his brother, would sit there. Um, my dad would sit next to my grandmother just here, next to Mr. and Mrs. George. And at the front there were two little, funny little sisters, Margaret and Beth, who I used in one of my musicals, Amazing Grace. I just thought they were so sweet and I still remember them with fondness. The prayer meetings used to take place in the corner and actually just somewhere under here is the baptistry where I, I got baptised when I was about 14 years old. We would sit at the back, my mum, my brothers, and uh, and the sound, you know, I, I can still hear them, hear the, hear the singing here, it was fantastic. <laughs> and um, they, they say in the old days they used to have people sitting on the, uh, on the windowsills here, it was so full. It wasn't quite that full as I was growing up, but Christmas time it was, it was uh, full to the rafters. We must have seemed like an odd lot to the people in the street, coming here three times on a Sunday, even when the sun was shining. Singing and playing music were a major part of Mal's life when he was growing up. His grandmother was the chapel organist, and at seven, he discovered the guitar. My brother went on holiday to Spain when I was about seven and he brought back a Spanish guitar and I nicked it. <laughs> and it just felt, felt very natural to, uh, you had a little book, you know, teach yourself with Bert Whedon team of the day and, and then there was some um, like really simple songs like, oh, oh cinema, where you gonna run to? Oh cinema, two chords, and you know, you could do a, you do a whole gig, that's, that's one less than status quo and I still got by, you know, with a, with a church service, so, oh, on that day. So, and after that, it was just trying to get faster and faster and, and then listening to records and trying to work out how they did those things. And it was through one of his brother's mates that the music industry suddenly became aware of young Mal. I played him some songs that I'd written. He said, you should send those to John Peel on Radio 1. John Peel was a cult DJ who had a late night show. Mal sent in a demo tape and on the strength of it, he was invited up to the studios in London to perform. He was just 13 years old. I remember a couple of weeks later, a letter coming back from John Walters, who was John Peel's producer, basically asking my mum and dad, could they get in touch to see whether I could come do a session for their radio programme. And that's sort of when my life changed. So we all had new suits. Uh, we all got the train to London, uh, met all these, you know, heroes as they were all these disc jockeys like Johnny Walker you know bumped into Jimmy Young and and all that took my autograph book up I suppose it must have been you know quite charming this kid turning up with a guitar and and then I did the session John Peel was amazing well the whole that whole organization was amazing they they rang everybody that they could think of who might be interested in, in a 12 year old singer songwriter and basically got me a record deal you know and there were two record companies that were interested in, in particular 
and John Waters, who was John Peel's uh, producer, said, um, there's one we're not quite sure, it might be a bit fly-by-night, uh, they're called Virgin. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is Elton John's record label, and we know Elton, and he's a good guy, and the people associated with him are good people. So, and the thing that swung it was that um, the guy who had sort of mentored Elton John, a guy called Steve Brown, his dad had been in the Salvation Army. So it, that sort of gave my parents a bit of confidence that, that they, they were the right people to go with. Six weeks later, Mal was signed to Elton John's Rocket Record Company. I hadn't met him the first day of recording. It was, um, you know, there was a telegram there from Elton. He could never quite get my name right initially. He used to call me Blodwin Pig for a long time because it was a band around the same time. And then he used to call me Madwin. And in, in the end, he used to call me Maldwin uh, rather than Maldwin. So, uh, but he was incredibly kind and incredibly generous. That, and they, they all were, you know, then they, they wanted to make it special. So we arrived, my big brother David and I arrived at uh, Paddington Station. They, they picked us up in a white Rolls Royce because they thought that would be, you know, the right way to treat a, a new pop star. And so began a new life, a heady mix for the teenager, of going to school and then performing and living with rock stars during the holidays. They do incredibly uh, exciting things. Like one morning I was staying at Elton's house, and he said, right, we're going to have a great day today. Uh, and we got in the Rolls Corniche, you know, put the top down. He had two massive towels, both with Superstar written on them. And we drove to the Watford football ground. And I trained with Watford Football Club all day. But Elton was the biggest star in the world and couldn't give his full attention to, to everything. I mean, during that whole period, he was incredibly generous with his, his time and his influence. I remember, you know, I, I used to go and stay at his house, first in Virginia Water. Uh, and I always say he beat me at bar football, but I beat him at Sabudia football. You know? But he was, he was like a big kid. Uh, and, you know, to go around this, this house with the, the... He had every pinball machine. He had all the toys that you would expect, you know, together with all the, the gold discs. And he was just incredibly supportive of what I was doing. A single was released, and it made the charts. But unfortunately, it wasn't a number one hit. I remember writing to Elton and saying, I feel like I'm a 16-year-old failure. <laughs> and he must have been, I mean, you know. Hey, hey, hey. The pair continued to work together, but times were changing. There's a, almost like a golden moment, I think, in people's careers. And mine was probably that early 70s. So by the time I got to 77, 78, and I'm making songs like Elton John, the world is changing, you know. So I've got these records with big string orchestras, and the world is starting to go punk. Mal decided to accept a place at Cambridge University to study economics. His teacher parents had encouraged him to continue his studies as well as sing, although he did have a slight wobble about what to read after his first year. For 20 minutes I told this young fellow of my college why I thought I ought to do theology and uh, he made me tea and biscuits and hardly said a word and then at, at, when I finished talking I remember him looking over his glasses at me, very big bushy black eyebrows and said, Mal, it's not for you. It was Dr Rowan Williams who became the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> he obviously saw through me completely. After Cambridge, Mal lived in London and played in bars and clubs under the guidance of music promoter Harvey Goldsmith. But after a year, he decided to return to Wales to be with his girlfriend, Hilary. It just wasn't working out, and London was, is cold if you haven't got any money. And so I was gonna get married to my childhood, childhood sweetheart, so we moved back to Wales. Mal found work as a radio producer for BBC Radio Wales, but music was always present, and he started working with a record producer. Some of Mal's songs were picked up by pop star Cliff Richard and The Hollies. My wife was pregnant, and I remember telling my mum and dad, I'm leaving the BBC and I'm going to become a singer-songwriter again. And they, I mean, it must have been horrendous. Um, but uh, I had an advance from a, from a publishing company and then managed to sort of, from there on, really ride two horses, the broadcasting and the, and the music. And in 1987, it seemed like the world was again back on my feet because Cliff had done a song, the Hollies were on their 25th uh, anniversary tour and... You know, having recorded all these songs by people like Bruce Springsteen, they were recording my songs and they were at the Albert Hall. And I also got through to the final of the Song for Europe. <laughs> so it's like, you know, one of them was bound to, to come through in big time. And bit by bit, 
none of them came to, to really fruition. Uh, Cliff changed his producer, so the song ended up as a B-side. The Hollies played the Albert Hall, did all the TV programs and they weren't hits. And uh, I got through to the final song for Europe, 17 million people, me and Terry Wogan came last. I think I came fourth actually, but it doesn't sound the same, does it? But despite the huge disappointments, it wasn't long before a new opportunity arose. And this time it was television and his own show on HTV Wales. I remember doing the TV programme with Cliff Richard. Uh, it was for the, you know, the, it took hours of executive decision to come up with the name The Mal Pope Show. Uh, but to get somebody like Cliff Richard on a programme, on a regional programme at that stage, was hard. We're all going on a... But Mal's musical and him singing background helped break the ice during interviews. Fun and laughter on a summer holiday. Catch up with us in part two to find out about Mal's music and media career today. Singer-songwriter Mal Pope from Swansea was a child prodigy signed to Elton John's record label at 13. As a teenager, he performed with some of the biggest stars of the 70s and 80s. He never quite reached superstardom, but his talent led to a successful radio and TV career interviewing stars like the Bee Gees, David Gray and Bonnie Tyler. Well, here you go. Well, this is it. I'm going to get a master class. Well, if I can remember it. Feeling that so easily Where the four winds blow I go below No sentence I can speak For the wonder so unique Breaking like a wave upon the shore I was lost in the France, and the vines are all flowing. I was lost in the France, and the million stars are going away. Possibly my favourite show was doing a thing called Heaven's Sound, and it was an idea that Welsh hymn singing with that mining background and gospel music in the deep south had a similar role to play in people's lives of getting them through, you know, always this thought of a promised land. I was born and raised and grown in this ugly, lovely town From a child that have believed I'm heaven bound And though the pretty gates and golden streets have often left my mind My heart has held on tightly to the sound As well as his radio and TV presenting, Mal was able to grab opportunities when they came along. I get a call from a friend who's a guy called Martin Joseph, and he's just been on tour with Art Garfunkel. And uh, he said, I can't do the next tour, and I've put your name up for doing it instead. Well, the strange thing was, I was really looking forward to interviewing Art Garfunkel for the primetime show, which I was presenting at the time, because uh, he'd been a massive influence on my whole career. And then suddenly, instead of interviewing for that gig, I'm actually on the gig. And it meant, you know, letting the TV go. And you never know with the Steve Jobs if they're ever going to come back again. It meant letting the radio go. But everybody sort of played ball because it was Art Garfunkel. It was a really wonderful experience. And I wrote songs every night, met some incredible people. In amongst all the uncertainty that goes with the music territory, Mal's band, Mal Pope and the Jacks, has remained one of the constants. And it was the band that caught the attention of another Radio 1 DJ. We'd do a set that lasted an hour and a half and every song would run into the next one because you wouldn't give people a chance to sit down. So they'd dance all night and then they'd book you again and they'd tell people and the repetition. And then we started picking up some, some gigs, like we did a gig for Joan Collins when she came to Swansea uh, at a charity do and David Manville was there and I met David. And, and then they asked us to do some gigs in London and then uh, Joan Collins got us to do, I think she maybe introduced us to Linda Lusardi and Linda Lusardi's wedding and... And then who's there was, uh, you know, Amanda Holden was there with Les Dennis and, uh, you know, all these sort of showbiz greats and up on stage came, you know, Eddie Large, who was like five foot four, who was singing backing vocals with my guitarist, who's six foot four, and Lionel Blair was there. And then suddenly we had a whole new world. And then the phone went and I got a call from Simon Mayo, who was on, who was the breast breakfast DJ on Radio 1 at that stage. And I sort of knew him through some sort of uh, connections. And he said, we're looking for a band to play at my 40th birthday. But it can't, we can't have a name band because people might not listen. 
and I know you're doing really well with these things. Would would you come and do it? But people might not listen, okay? And I'm saying that's fine. That's what we do. We used to we used to being loud enough, so it doesn't matter. After the gig, Simon Mayo couldn't praise the band enough, and Mal was headline news. Listen to what this national DJ has to say about him. There are a number of things that are truly wonderful about this man. First of all, he's balder, fatter and older than I am. But most importantly, his band are the tightest band you've ever heard, who play songs in a quite extraordinary way. They are quite simply the best band to have at your party. My wife was home, she said, there's something happening. She said, there's people ringing the phone all the time. Is they on the answer phones going mad. I said, well, what are they saying? She said something about they want to book you. And then somebody rang me on my mobile and said, have you listened to Radio 1 this morning? I said, no. He said, Simon Mayo's giving out your home telephone number. He's claiming you're the band of the century. And for two weeks, it became a running joke on his programme that he'd give out my home number. You know, they'd have Brian Adams in and they interviewed him. And at the end of it, they'd start talking amongst the, you know, the, the, the zoo format they had. And they said, yeah, Brian Adams is good. He's not as good as Mal Pope and the Jacks, though. And it was a real interesting point because I could have gone one way with that. And we were on page three of the Daily Star and all, all, all that thing, you know, unknown band becomes the band of the century. And I thought to myself, do I want to go out every night and play other people's songs? And I killed it. I just said, guys, I'm really sorry. I don't want to do this. In 1995, Mal had written a musical with Swansea novelist, the late Iris Gower, called Copper Kingdom. It showcased here at the city's Grand Theatre. Drawing on this experience, Mal decided it was time to challenge himself by writing another one. It's coming up to 2004, and how do you mark that? And music seemed the obvious thing because Evan Roberts, his religious revival in 1904 was called a singing revival. And I'd always wanted to find a way of putting a Welsh culture onto stage like the Irish had done with, you know, River Dance and the Scots with Braveheart and all that. So it seemed the obvious way, but I gotta tell you, the reaction I had when I first started talking to people was, Disastrous. I thought there was. Everybody thought it was going to be dampened, and you know, Sunday afternoonish. And it, it, you know, I wanted to put the humour into it as well. So you make people laugh and make people cry, and then using those hymns as the basis for the for the sound of the show. And then the second one was about Tommy Farr, the boxer, and we opened it here with uh, Mike Doyle playing the role of, of Tommy Farr, and it was, yeah, it was it was lovely to see it. Enzo Macaronelli and his dad were were very helpful in putting the, uh, you know, the uh, the boxing elements correct into that. And I, I remember Enzo Macronelli walking in after Mike Doyle had done his first show and he said, ah, what do you think, Enzo? And he said, yeah, he said, it's good, but you drop in your left. <laughs> Mal then moved on to a hugely ambitious project of setting up his own theatre in Swansea's High Street to stage his next musical. I'd written a song called Cappuccino Girls, which essentially was the story of my wife and her mates. They'd go, they'd put, drop the kids off at school, They'd go and have a cup of coffee and they'd talk these, you know, hair curling stories that, she, that she'd come and tell me about when, you know, in confidence, obviously. And uh, I found out that they were known locally as the Cappuccino Girls. And I just thought, wow, what a great title. When he's not working, Mal can be found at the Liberty Stadium supporting his favourite team. He's written songs for the Swans, and as a youngster he was a keen footballer. He and his brothers would watch the matches at the Vetch. I played quite a lot of soccer as a kid, and I can almost pinpoint the moment my football career ended. Uh, my dad saw every match, and I was captain of Swansea Schoolboys, um, and Roy Bentley, who was the manager of the Swans at the time, turned to this little fellow at the side of the pitch, it happened to be my dad, said, who's playing midfield? And he said, that's, that's Maldwin Pope. And he wrote the name down in his little book. And by the end of the week, he'd been sacked. But the music probably took over. And, um, yeah, I, I probably slowed down a bit and the eyes went and all those sort of things. So, but became a fan, you know, and saw that great rise to the top of the, uh, of top of the first division, the old first division. And the great thing was some of my friends from the old school days were actually in the team. It's amazing for the city, you know, this... I grew up looking at this area. My house is, you know, where I was born is just up the hill, and it was like the surface of Mars. And now look at it, it's green, it's a, it's a green and pleasant land. It's a real story of regeneration, of revival, you know, and it's a, it's a great symbol uh, that Swansea could rise again from those ashes. Across town from the Liberty Stadium is another regeneration area 
which is home to Mal's latest project, his film company, YJB. I suppose it's the start of a new, new chapter, really. Um, I'd always wanted to make a film, and I told somebody I, I was going to, and, and now we are. So uh, who knows how it's going to turn out. I'm not going to say goodbye to all the other things as well, but for the moment this seems to be the real centre of attention and focus. I've got to get this right. i um, got a really good team together, so uh, hopefully by the spring of next year our first feature documentary will be released. And he's already composing the music for it. This is the town Wouldn't die Inside the gates of hell And stab the devil in his eyes This is the town That saw its past go up in flames And should bolt again Upon the memories and names And if we fall Then we shall rise It's still a secret at the moment because, you know, what the Burma mum always say, there's many a slip, twix, cup and lip. Um, but it's going very well and we're all ready to, to rock and roll, as they say. So as long as all the pieces now uh, fall in the right places, then we're, uh, we've got a film. With the many works in progress, running along Mumbles' beautiful seafront helps clear Mal's head and allows him to plan. The father of four has already written a prequel and sequel to the hit Cappuccino Girls, and plans another musical about Swansea poet Dylan Thomas. It's been fantastic, you know, the journey, but it isn't over, you know, and I think that's, you know, it, it can be incredibly ageist these days, but you know, I'm actually a much better songwriter than I was when I was 13, and I've got more experience than I had when I was 13. I keep on thinking, well, Maybe I'm better prepared now to do all of those things that I, that I still dream I want to do.